Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Christ Reformed Church on this Lord's Day, the first Sunday after the Epiphany. We welcome those who are with us today, uh, our members as well as those who are visiting. Uh, welcome. And we also welcome uh, those who are plugging in online this morning through our live stream. Uh, we pray that today's service will both uh, encourage you, uh, be a blessing to you, and spur you on to the completion of the Great Commission and serving the Lord your God wherever it is that he has placed you in this world. I do have just a couple brief announcements I want to run through with you today. I'll draw your attention uh, to the memorial stand as, as well as the altar flowers. You can read uh, about that in, in your bulletin insert. Also, our prayers and concerns. A special thank you to everyone who came out on Thursday morning uh, to take down the decorations from our Advent and Christmas tide season. That was very much appreciated. Also, want to mention the Red Cross a Blood Drive, which is coming up on February 8th. Flower sponsors are needed for February. The sign-up sheet is down in, in the um, first floor hallway, or you can call Katerina in the church office to uh, request uh, flowers for a particular Sunday. The birthday booklets are out. They're on the welcome table. You can help yourselves uh, to, to one downstairs in the fellowship hall. What else do we need to mention? Today is the launch of uh, our new relationship with Right Now Media. Uh, the Board of Christian Ed uh, has been working behind the scenes in, in uh, meeting with them, and uh, we are going to launch today. Uh, everyone in our congregation is going to receive a, a free membership to Right Now Media, and you can read all about that in, in the bulletin. It's going to be a great tool in your toolbox for personal devotions or Bible studies. Um, there's even media available to you like uh, seminars and conferences and, and Christian uh, movies. Uh, that, that's all going to be provided to you for free. The only thing that, that we really need is your email address. And you will be getting an email if we already have it today with the link uh, that takes you to Right Now Media where you can begin to uh, utilize and enjoy uh, those services gratis of, of the church. Uh, Michelle will be down in the fellowship hall immediately following the service, running like a, a three to five minute video loop, which is kind of like a tutorial that, that'll take you through, introduce you to uh, Right Now Media. So, so you can hang out in the fellowship hall today uh, for a few minutes to, to check that out. And of course, if you have any questions whatsoever, you can see Michelle Tabirin about that. Today we're going to welcome uh, to the pulpit during our Bible teaching time for, for our sermon, Pastor Casey Hovarth. Uh, he's a dear friend of mine who I've had the privilege to meet through our relationship with the Four C's we met a couple years ago uh, at, at conference. And uh, he's kind of in the neighborhood out, out in Lebanon County, and uh, he was in town this weekend, and, and we wanted to give him the opportunity to speak from the pulpit, and uh, I trust you will give him a warm welcome. His family's here in the front row as well. Katie, children, welcome. Is there anything else? Did I miss anything, Andy? Emmeline? If not, let's stand for our call to worship. Happy are we who hear the joyful call to worship, for we walk in the light of God's presence. Let's worship God together, for he rules over the surging sea, and when its waves mount up, he stills them. For God is our strength and our protection, the one in whom we trust. Our opening hymn is hymn number 358. It's the Navy hymn.
Let us now confess our sins together. O sovereign and gracious God, though I praise you with my lips, from my heart I recognize and confess my sin and unworthiness to be called your child or to claim Jesus as my brother. I have failed and offended you in my thoughts, words, and deeds. Yet now I cry out to you for forgiveness. Make me holy by the blood of Jesus and help me to be your obedient child. And then, as I have found your love and forgiveness, help me to show others who have wandered from your ways back to you. This I humbly pray. Amen. The scriptures make this sure and glad promise that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Know that your sins are forgiven in Christ Jesus who died for you on Calvary's tree. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, our loving, loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, the only name given under heaven by which men must call upon in order to be saved. We thank you, Jesus, for leaving your first estate in your heavenly home and coming to this earth to be born in a manger to the Virgin Mary in a backwater town called Bethlehem in order to live a life here on this earth amongst your people, not just as an example, not just as a, as a good teacher, but as the God-man, the Savior of the world, to live that life perfectly, sinlessly, in order to offer it up as the final sacrificial lamb of God, perfect and pleasing in his sight, so that our sins may be forgiven, that we can stand right before our Father in heaven, and that we can walk humbly on this earth as, as your elect, your called out ones, the sheep of your pasture. We thank you for your church here on the earth, the church militant, we ask that you continue to watch over her, to guide her, to keep her pure, untainted from the sins of this world, so that we may be an example unto all of those who are still outside of the family, who, who live without hope, who are in dire need of your saving grace. May they see something different in us, May we be a sweet aroma uh, unto you, and may you use us by some small measure to irresistibly draw uh, those scattered sheep, those who are still lost, unto yourself. Uh, we pray, Lord, for the continued ministries here at, at Christ Reformed Church, and, and we think uh, of the launch of our a uh, new relationship with Right Now Media. Uh, we pray, Lord, that that would not just uh, be something that gets put aside or on the shelf or um, unappreciated, but that we would use that uh, to help us in the transformation of our minds, in the renewing of our spirits, and in the equipping us to, to be uh, your epistles, your ambassadors here in the Indian Valley. We also pray for our sister church, our daughter church, uh, Light East Church in Souderton, and ask that you continue to smile down upon her, bless her, encourage her, use her during these difficult times. Uh, we, we pray for their continued search uh, for a new senior pastor, and, and ask, Lord, um, that you open doors and close them, uh, guide uh, their steps as, as they plan their ways, and lead them. Uh, to the man of your choosing. We also want to pray this morning uh, for Patty and Joey. 
and the entire family as they grieve the loss of their husband, their father. We just pray, Lord, that um, you would comfort and encourage them during this difficult season. Uh, we know you have a special place in your heart for, for orphans and for widows. Help us to, to bear that burden. Help us to be your hands and feet, uh, especially to Patty. We just pray your peace upon their household. We also want to pray this morning for our guest speaker, Casey Hovarth. Uh, we welcome him, and we thank you in your providence for uh, allowing him uh, to be here uh, today. And we look forward to hearing from him. We just ask that you do speak through him. Help him to give a good account of himself and his studies this past week as he presents your word unto us. And we ask thy Holy Spirit to apply that word to our hearts and to our minds and that we would be renewed and transformed by it. And dear Lord God, we also want to pray for our nation. We know this nation is temporary and transient, yet it is our temporal home. So we pray for her. We ask that you would be gracious towards us, merciful towards us, that you would not hold our sins against us. We pray, Lord, for peace, peace on uh, the streets of the capital, peace on the streets of the major cities, and, and peace here in our own neighborhood. We pray for the peace that passes all understanding that can only come from a right relationship with you. Uh, we pray, Lord, that even in the darkest hours of the night, we know that that's when the lamp and the beacon shines the brightest, that this would be our opportunity to shine. Pray, Lord, for your light to permeate the darkness. Uh, we pray for our leaders and our newly elected leaders, um, that you would use them. We know that you use good leaders, you use bad leaders, you use everyone in between. Whether it's old wicked Haman and Azarius, or whether it was Pharaoh, or whether it's King David. Uh, we just pray that you would work through uh, our elected officials uh, in our nation, in our commonwealth, and, and here in our own uh, municipalities, boroughs, and towns. Uh, we trust you. We do not trust men. But we know that you're a good God, you're a benevolent God, that you have a plan and a purpose in all things, so we can trust you. Now as we join our hearts and minds together in prayer, let us also join our voices as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 460, Search Me, O God.
This time I'll ask the uh, ushers to please come forward. Let us pray. Lord, you have blessed us so much. You blessed us uh, spiritually. Uh, You blessed us physically. You also blessed us financially. Uh, We thank you for seeing to all of our needs and then some. So Lord, now as uh, we continue to worship you uh, by the sacrificial giving of just a portion of the blessings that you've showered down upon us, may these tithes, these offerings, Uh, be given both cheerfully, sacrificially, and may they be received by you to strengthen your church here at Indian Creek, in the Indian Valley, and around the globe. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. It's now time, yes, for the children's sermon. <clears throat> Would you mind handling that? You always want to come on up. You can. You don't have to. But you can come up here. Hi, Jason. You always going to hang out there in the front row. My mom and pop up, that's okay. I think you can hear and see pretty well from there, can't you? Good. How you doing today, Jason? Good. Great. Hey, I brought something in with me uh, I wanted to show you. But before I show you that, perhaps, let me share with everyone uh, from the lectionary today's gospel reading. It's from the gospel of Mark, uh, the first chapter. I'll just read how about two verses, verse 10 and 11. As Jesus was coming up out of the water... He saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a 
dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. I brought this in this morning to show you. Do you know what this is? Let me turn it, let me open it to a couple pages here. Have any idea what this is? Calendar. It is a calendar. It, it's actually called a desktop calendar. I, I think it's a relic, perhaps even an antique. I don't know how many people still use the desktop calendar, but Pastor Scott does. Um, and I, I find it extremely helpful and handy to have on my desk. Um, there's last year, November uh, 2020, December 2020. You can see I got some appointments written down um, on my desktop calendar. And then this one, which I find extremely helpful, uh, doesn't get discarded at the end of the year, but you just turn the page and what do you have? Can you read that? January 2021. That's right, the new year. So I can continue with this, this calendar and put in my appointments or, or plans and, and uh, I have everything um, that I need right there at my fingertips on my desk. That's pretty handy. Now, what makes it so handy is we make plans and, and we make uh, appointments. Uh, there's, there's special dates that we want to remember. Um, and a calendar helps us to do that. Now, this is um, a brand new year. And I don't know, have you, have you been busy yet this year? Have you done a lot of things? <laughs> Help me out. <laughs> Not much, yeah, it's kind of, uh, we just began the new year. Um, but it is an exciting time. In, in our gospel reading for today, there's a, a, a new start, a, a new beginning that's kind of pictured here in the baptism uh, uh, of Jesus, and, and that's the baptism uh, of John. John was going around um, baptizing people for the forgiveness of sins. He was baptizing them as they were coming out into the wilderness in the Jordan River. And one day, Jesus himself was baptized by John. Not because he had any sins to confess or be forgiven of, um, but to begin or to, this is a fancy word, and I want to teach this word to you, inaugurate. Can you say that? Inaugurate. Inaugurate his earthly ministry. And that was accomplished by the approval of his father. Do you remember in our reading, what did God the Father say of God the Son, of Jesus, after he was baptized. He pronounced um, that this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. So we have sort of a new beginning um, with the new year, a new opportunity uh, to get right with the Lord, to confess our sins, to, to walk closer with him. And baptism is, is a good picture of that. Um, that's one of the ways in which uh, God communicates his eternal truth and he works his means uh, to help us in our journey here on the earth with him. As a matter of fact, uh, Jesus would later command um, that we, the church, baptize um, people from all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and to do what? To teach them to obey everything that Jesus had commanded. So we still have baptisms today. I think it's over there. Yeah, we still have the baptismal font um, that we use um, to celebrate this new birth, um, this new beginning, uh, spiritually speaking. Uh, would you pray with me? Dear Father, we do thank you for your son, we thank you for all that he accomplished for us. We thank you for our baptism. And we thank you for this new year. Uh, help us, as, as Martin Luther used to say, to remember our baptism, uh, to seek out opportunities uh, to serve him, 
uh, to live our lives according to everything that he has taught us. And when the times are tough, when storms and tempests and danger and trials and tribulations come our way, uh, may we remember our baptism and that we have eternal life in you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Jason. You can go down to Junior Church. Maybe you want to show you. Jason, maybe you want to show your buddies, new buddies there where Junior Church is. Are they going to go down? They're welcome to. <laughs> Elder Andy Tabirin will share our scripture reading for today. Andy? Thanks. Good morning, church. Our scripture reading today is from uh, the book of Acts, chapter 27, and this can be found on page 1741 of your Pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. Listen now to the historical account of Paul and others' a journey to Rome. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Adramidium, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. From there, we put out to sea again and passed to the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. <clears throat> when we had sailed across the open sea, off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Snidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete, opposite Salmone. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens, near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, men, I can see our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force, called a northeaster, swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Calda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from that storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. 
But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea, when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that they would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In, a, in an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from below. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. I am truly delighted to be here uh, worshiping with you today, and I'm grateful that Scott invited me to uh, come and be a guest, so thank you for having me. Uh, I've enjoyed my time of worship uh, thus far. As we begin a new year, the year 2021, we might like to look back on 2020 with all its craziness and say, what a shipwreck of a year. We might even have other choice descriptors that we would like to use. But, as we've already seen just a couple weeks into this new year, we are not automatically guaranteed peace and prosperity in 2021. In fact, this year, and maybe even the next four years, will turn out to be another shipwreck. Because none of us know what this year will hold, or what the next four years will hold, or eight years. Because we don't know what lies ahead. This morning, I want to shepherd your hearts and your minds by looking at one of the most famous shipwrecks of all time. 
So please take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 27. And as you turn there, I'm going to pray a prayer of illumination. Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would illuminate these verses for us. Show us your sovereignty and goodness and allow our minds and hearts to rest in you. We pray this by the power of the Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. As these words of Holy Scripture were read to us, it might seem like Acts 27 is simply part of the chronological account of Paul's journey from Caesarea to Rome. And some biblical commentators have made much of Luke's maritime descriptors. In fact, Luke's detailed account of this shipwreck has been of great interest to those who are studying antiquity and in particular first century seafaring and sea voyage. Now, there is something to be said about Luke's detailed writing, for it does validate the authenticity of his account. The things which Luke records are not fable, they're not fiction, they're not just a story, but they are things that he is eyewitness to. And so his details do serve us in giving us confidence in the text that he is an eyewitness to this. This is not just made up. But is that all that is here for us in Acts 27? Is it just some detailed chronological account of Paul's journey mixed in with some interesting naval vernacular? Is that what's here for us? Dear Saint, I submit to you this morning that there is much here in Acts 27 for your heart in my heart. Acts 27 demonstrates God's sovereignty, in which he providentially controls the circumstances surrounding the life of the Apostle Paul. Furthermore, this chapter establishes the fact that God does so with a specific purpose. Therefore, Acts 27 should serve as a comfort for our souls. Just as God was in control of the storm and the subsequent shipwreck in Paul's life, so God is providentially ordering the circumstances in the lives of his saints, including you and me. As the shipwreck in Acts 27 was purposefully used by God, so the storms... And the shipwrecks in our own lives are serving the very sovereign purposes of God. With that being said, this morning, I want you to lay hold of two things by faith. First, in believing by faith, I want you to believe that God is sovereign over the storms of your life. He is sovereign over your hardship. He is sovereign over your suffering. Second, by faith, I want you to lay a hold of this. God is purposely using your shipwreck. He is using your hardship and he is using your suffering for your good and his glory. So let's begin by considering point number one. God is sovereign over the storms and shipwrecks of this life. Throughout the narrative that we just read, Luke draws our attention to details which tell of God's sovereignty. In verse 1, we are told that Paul is put under the guard of a centurion who was of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And in verse 3, we learn that the centurion was kind to Paul as he gave him special privilege in Sidon. And in verse 43, that same centurion saves the apostle Paul's life from being executed. The relationship that Paul has with this centurion, this man Julius, is unique and thus noteworthy for Luke to record. The Roman commander is in fact a providential grace from the very hand of God. Furthermore, 
In verse 2, Luke tells us that God ordained close companions to accompany Paul on this journey. Luke was one of those companions, along with a man named Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica who first appears in Luke's narrative in the city of Ephesus. He was seized by the rioting mob who recognized him as one of Paul's companions in Acts chapter 19. He accompanied Paul on his return to Jerusalem, and now he is with Paul on his voyage to Rome. Later on, Paul will write to the church in Colossae, and he will say that Aristarchus is still with me. All of these little details about Julius, about Paul's loyal friends, all of these details that Luke records for us paints a picture of God's orchestrating ability, his sovereign and providential care over the Apostle Paul's life. Paul is going to embark on a long and strenuous journey to Rome, and he is going to do so by God's design and God's orders. But God will give him faithful friends who will encourage him, laugh with him, and even feast with him along the way. And not only so, but Paul will also have a personal security detail guarding him all the way to Rome. These details certainly demonstrate God's providential care, but at no greater point in chapter 27 is God's sovereignty put on full display than in verses 21 through 26. And so I'm actually going to read those verses again with you, and so you can look at verse 21, and I'll read through verse 26. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me, and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. In Matthew chapter 8, as the disciples were caught in a storm at sea, there we are shown that Jesus is Lord over the created order, and thus even the wind and waves obey him. Nothing in the created order is outside the scope of Christ's authoritative lordship. That is communicated to us in Matthew chapter 20 or Matthew 8. And here in Acts 27, again we see that God is sovereign over Paul's circumstances. God is in control of the wind and the waves. Even to the point that God is able to cause a shipwreck and yet preserve every single life on that ship. And not only so, but orchestrate and direct every passenger to wash up on the same exact shore. These details are truly remarkable. And from these verses, what should come as great comfort to us this very morning is this. God is not only sovereignly in control over Paul's life, but God is sovereignly in control of your life. Listen to the Westminster Confession of Faith on this very point. Quote, God, the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible foreknowledge, and the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. 
End quote. Dear Saint, the shipwrecks of this life are not outside of God's control. Perhaps you have been given a cancer diagnosis. Maybe you are grieving the loss of a loved one. Maybe you are saddened by the waywardness of a son or daughter. Conceivably, you have experienced trouble this very week. Whatever the case may be, what I want you to understand is this. The very circumstances you find yourself in this morning are not outside of God's sovereign control. Perhaps you are here this morning and you have a legitimate grasp on the sovereignty of God over your own life. You truly believe that he is in control. But in your sorrow, in your loss, in the heartache, maybe frustration, the fear, the anxiety, you do believe in God's sovereignty, but these things are real and they're pressing upon you. And you are asking, why God? Why this sickness? Why this loss? Why her and not me? Why this ailment? Why this financial loss? In verse 20, Luke states the following. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of being saved was lost and abandoned. After being in the grip of the Northeaster and feeling lost and abandoned, I can only imagine that the Apostle Paul was asking this same question you yourself are asking. Why, God? Paul says, I'm sure you've ordained that I go to Rome. I'm willing to go to Rome. What is the point of being exposed to the harsh elements of a violently storm-tossed ship for weeks on end? And not only do I believe that Paul was asking why, but in verse 24, we learn that Paul was afraid, and undoubtedly so. And in response to Paul's fear, along with his own questioning of why, God, in his kindness, sends an angel. It's easy for our minds to comprehend Jonah's storm-tossed experience on the open waters, suffering as a result of warranted discipline makes sense. There's an easy, logical connection in our minds. But it's harder to understand the Apostle Paul's suffering as he's a righteous person. And things can even get harder to grasp when we ourselves suffer. And so it becomes easy to ask, why? This is a logical and rational thought. Why, God? Why? And I get why you are asking why this morning. I understand. On April 12th of 2013, my first son... Judah Blaze was born. He lived for two hours, and then he died in the arms of my wife. And I'll never forget this scene. I pulled my car up to a queue of cars outside the maternal ward of the hospital. And in front of me was father after father after father preparing the car seat in the back of their car 
and then pulling up to the entrance of the hospital and their wives coming out with their new child. And I remember those children getting into the car seat and those families driving away. And it will never leave me the moment that I pulled my car up to the doors and met my beautiful wife, the bride that I love, empty-handed. We did not fill the back seat of our car. And we drove away full of sorrow and heartache with a deep question of why. I get why you yourself this very morning might be asking why. In the midst of your heartache, your illness, your loss, Whatever the hardship or suffering is that has caused you to feel just like the Apostle Paul, where all hope of being saved is lost and abandoned, I get why you are asking why. And in answering the why, I want to draw upon the teaching of pastor and author Dr. Peter Lightheart. When commenting on the book of Acts, he rightly notes that the ministry of the apostles follows the ministry of Christ, chronologically, but even in terms of the events themselves. And there is an observable parallel to which Dr. Lightheart states that the apostles are essentially living scripted lives. Lives that are scripted after the life of Christ. And so this helps us understand why Paul is suffering on a storm-tossed ship. It is because Christ himself came to suffer. And no servant is greater than his master. In Acts chapter 9, we learn that Paul was actually predestined to suffer. In fact, Acts chapter 27 is the chapter that is the parallel to Christ's crucifixion in the gospel accounts. And so Christ suffered, and so must Paul. And here's the reality for you and I. Dr. Lightheart notes this, our lives, you and me, like the apostles, are scripted too. Just as Paul was called to suffer, so you and I, who name the name of Christ, have been predestined to suffer as well. Again, Christ tells us that we will suffer like him, for no servant is greater than his master. And the prophet Isaiah tells us that our Lord was a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And I'll remind you of Acts chapter 14, in which the Apostle Paul and Barnabas said, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, the Apostle Paul says this, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Church, suffering has been sovereignly written into the script of the Christian life. It is providentially written into your life and my life. We too have been predestined to suffer. Now, I realize that this is a heavy word to receive this morning. And it feels very much full of doom and gloom. But do not despair. Comfort is coming. And this brings us to our second point. First point was this. God is, in fact, sovereign over your suffering. Point number two. God is purposely using your suffering for your good and his glory. When Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome... 
under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he famously said this, And we know that for those who love God, all things are working together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. These are not the words of a trite saying or a cliché greeting card. In fact, there is nothing trite about them. These words are weighty and sacred because these words proceed from the very mouth of God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And if you read Romans 8.28, or any verse of scripture for that matter, And your immediate thought is this, well, that's just pithy. You've only responded that way because your view or your posture toward the scriptures have become trite. The person who truly cherishes the word of God will find great comfort in Romans 8.28 because they know that this is God himself who has said their suffering Their sickness, their hardship, their heartache, their loss is not in vain. It is not without purpose. This is certainly the case with the Apostle Paul here in Acts 27. This shipwreck is not a fluke. It's not an accident. It's not the outworking of some bad karma. As we've already seen, Paul's shipwreck is actually being orchestrated by God. And not only is God in control of the shipwreck, but he has designed the shipwreck with specific purpose and specific aim. So first, God designed Paul's shipwreck for Paul's good. Through the practical means of suffering, Paul was being sanctified. And that sometimes is hard for us to grasp or imagine. Paul needing to be sanctified. We view him as a super apostle. But the reality is this. In that storm and on that shipwreck, Paul was being fashioned and formed into the image of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the same is true for you and me. By fiery trials, by financial loss because of a shutdown, by religious persecution, by hardship, the dross of unbelief and the dross of pride melt away, leaving the pure gold of faith and humility. God uses shipwrecks as a practical means to produce in us real spiritual fruit, real sanctification. Through hardship, we grow in faith, hope, love, patience, and endurance. J.C. Ryle said it this way, quote, There are no lessons so useful as those learned in the school of affliction. Suffering is purposeful. Your suffering is purposeful in that it produces and is producing right now real spiritual fruit for your good. Furthermore, for our good, suffering is designed to drive us to the throne of grace. It is in the valley of the shadow of death that we are tenderly ministered to by the shepherd of our souls. Suffering is purposeful in that through your sorrow, you might know the love of your heavenly Father. In your hardship, you might enjoy the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in your loss, experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Now think about this for a moment. Feel the weight of this reality and let your will conform to this truth. 
your suffering, your loss, your trials, all of it is not without purpose. But rather, it is providentially designed for your good. Namely, that you would be sanctified, fashioned into the image of Christ, and know him more intimately. Second, God's design for this shipwreck for Paul, God's purpose, his aim in this shipwreck, is his own glory. Charles Spurgeon famously said the following, quote, The Lord afflicts his servants in order to glorify himself, for he is greatly glorified in the graces of his people, which are his own handiwork. When suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, the Lord is honored. As God produces faith, hope, love, patience, and endurance in us, with the tools of suffering and affliction, he is in fact glorified. And this is clearly evident in the outworking of Paul's own faith, shown to us in verses 33 through 38. In the midst of the storm, having faith in God and his promises, Paul is able to thank God, to publicly glorify God. Now, I don't believe that Luke is inferring that Paul administered the Eucharist in this moment. But the Holy Spirit does draw another parallel between the ministry of the Apostle Paul and Christ's ministry. In chapter 22 of Luke's Gospel, we read, quote, And Jesus took bread, and we had given thanks, he broke it. And in Acts 27, Luke says the following, quote, Paul took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it. Through Paul's faith, which allowed him to be thankful and feast and glorify God in the midst of his suffering, God was honored, God was worshipped, God was glorified. And we see that by the response of all those who were on the ship, they too were encouraged by Paul's faith, and they themselves received God's provisions with thanksgiving. Christ, with a thankful heart toward the Father, instituted the sacrament of the table on the night that he was betrayed. And here, Paul, with thankfulness, on the dawn of his own shipwreck, believed in the power of what was preached in the sacrament. And so likewise, when you and I, in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our heartache, in the moments of loss, when you and I come to the Lord's table in faith, with thanksgiving, seeking the grace that is ours in Christ Jesus, God is, in fact, glorified. Finally, God used Paul's shipwreck to glorify himself through the work of salvation. At the end of verse 44, we read, And so it was that all were brought safely to land. According to his own free will, God chose to display his salvation and thus reveal his glory as the God who saves. As God saves you and I from sin, Satan, and death through the means of our justification, our adoption, and our glorification, God is glorified as the God who saves. And in fact, in the next chapter, God will demonstrate himself to be not only the God who saves from shipwreck, but he will demonstrate that he is the God who saves the soul. In fact, the 
island that they wash up on turns out to be a designed missionary journey of evangelism and healing that God has orchestrated for his glory to demonstrate that he is the God who saves men from his wrath. Likewise, as God saves you and I from calamity and affliction and even from our own sin and from his wrath, he demonstrates that he is the God who saves. And after we have suffered amid the storms and shipwrecks of this life, when we reach the shores of the eternal kingdom, there Jesus Christ will present us faultless before the Father. And he will be glorified by the multitude of saints that he has saved. And on that day, it can be said, like it is said here in Acts 27, quote, And so it was that all were brought safely. Dear saints, Acts 27 demonstrates God's sovereignty in which he providentially controlled the circumstances surrounding the Apostle Paul. But furthermore, Luke's account tells us that God did this with purpose, with aim. And thus I pray that your heart is comforted because just as God was in control of the storm and the shipwreck for Paul, so God is providentially ordering the very circumstances in your life. As the shipwreck in Acts 27 is purposely used by God, so the shipwrecks in our lives are providential. Therefore, this morning, I want you to lay hold of these two things. I want you to believe in faith that God is sovereign over your suffering and that God is purposely using your suffering for your good and his glory. As he comforts you and as he demonstrates he is the God who saves. In our proclivity to forget and in the nature of our feeble faith, we are prone to not believe these things to be true about God. And to that, the Apostle Paul says, look to the gospel. Hearkening back to Romans chapter 8, if God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously use our suffering for good? The beginning chapters of the book of Joshua God's saints, his people, are preparing to cross the Jordan and enter the promised land. And there is doubt and there is fear and there is anxiety of the armies that are on the other side of the Jordan. And there is fear. Will God be faithful? Will God do as he said he will do? Will we be victorious? Will we be saved? Will this really be our inheritance? And Joshua assembles the people together and he says, look to the Jordan River for a sign that will tell you, in fact, God is faithful. And as you know, as the priests put their foot in the Jordan River, the waters parted. And there was a sign that gave God's people faith in his promises. Likewise, in our feeble faith, in our proclivity to forget who God really is, I admonish you to do this. Saints, look to the gospel as evidence of God's sovereignty and his goodness. Jesus stepped onto the scene of history in miraculous fashion, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Being God, Jesus took on human flesh and became the God-man. He lived a sinless life for you, and for me, in our place, procuring real righteousness for us through his obedience to the Father. As our substitute, Jesus suffered and died on the cross in our place. He laid his life down as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. For us, he suffered under the wrath of God and absorbed the penalty 
you and I deserve for our sin and rebellion. He died. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose again in bodily form, defeating sin and death for us so that we too will one day rise like him from the dead unto eternal life with God the Father in heaven. Jesus was seen by over 500 eyewitnesses, and then he ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, reigning and ruling over our shipwrecks. When we embrace Jesus and his atoning sacrifice by grace through faith, and when we turn away from our sin and trust in him, we sinners who deserve God's wrath get God's grace. And this gospel is the empirical evidence which demonstrates that God is truly working all things together for your good and my good, even our shipwrecks. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, man. Well done. Very well done. Thank you, Casey, for that powerful, challenging, and encouraging word from the Lord. Would you please stand? Turn with me. To our closing hymn, it's hymn number 669, God of Grace and God of Glory. We'll just sing the first and the last. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.